Hey guys, we are here in the prison museum of The Hague. I'm gonna go check it out and see what the gruesome history behind this place. The Gaben Port or Prisoner's Gate is a former gate and medieval prison on the Putenhof in The Hague in the Netherlands. In 1280, the gate to the outer courtyard or Butenhof served as the main entrance to the castle of the Counts of Holland. In 1428, this front gate to the court also became a prison. It was where the falters were incarcerated and suspected criminals awaited their trials. A century later, the gate was expanded to include a section that held the jail cells and the courthouse. Suspects were kept in dark and cold cells while they awaited to be interrogated and sentenced. Sometimes that could take months, but imprisonment was not a punishment in itself until the 17th century. Actual sentences include fines, exile, public humiliation, and corporal and capital punishment. Famous patriots such as Cornelis de Witt and Dirk Volker Zun Kornhardt were incarcerated here. They stayed in their own luxury cell, known as the Reader Kammer or Knight's Chamber. It remained a prison for 400 years, until 1828, when the prison gate was vacated. It survived two demolition attempts, one in 1853, thanks to Minister Torbeck, and one in 1873, thanks to the Patriarch of the Natural Heritage Conservation Authorities, Victor de Sours. The prison gate was then converted into a museum in 1882. When the public executions went out of fashion, the area was used to build the Witte Society a literature club that still exists today, but had to move when the gate was torn down in 1923 to build this street that now allows busy traffic, including tramps. And since we are here at the museum, let me tell you about the story of its most famous occupant, Cornelius de Witt, and also his brother Johan. They both hold significant historical importance in the Netherlands, particularly in the relation to the prison gate. Both brothers played influential roles in the politics during the Dutch Golden Age in the mid-17th century. Cornelius was born in 1623 and his younger brother Johan in 1625. They were the leading statesmen of the Dutch Republic and opponents of the House of Orange from 1653 to 72. They were born in Dordrecht, a city in the south of the province of Holland, where their father, Jacob de Witt, had already served several times as alderman and burgomaster. Their mother was Anna von der Korput, a niece of Johannes Corpitius, an influential Dutch military leader and cartographer. Together, the brothers went to the Latin school and studied law at the University of Linden. They completed their education with a grand tour through France and England. About this time, it was evident that Johann excelled in his academics, notably in the field of mathematics. In the course of his busy life, he would find time to publish a pioneering work of geometry, the elements of curved lines, and his masterpiece, The Work of Life Annuities Compared to Redemption Bonds which is regarded today by historians of insurance as the foundation of modern actuarial science. Both brothers started their careers in a turbulent time when international developments and national events created unprecedented opportunities. First, there was the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which ended the wars the Dutch had fought for 80 years against the Spanish oppressor. The treaty was an official recognition of the Dutch territory as the United Provinces. The treaty also brought peace. The 
Princess of Orange had led the army against the Spanish and the cities had provided the funds, but now that peace has been attained, they broke up their confluence of interests. The merchants wanted to reduce the army budget and use their money for investments in trade and for the reduction of their enormous debts. But the young Prince of Orange, William II, could not accept the prospect of being stripped of this glamorous lifestyle. The second development took place across the English Channel, where Oliver Cromwell had put an end to the kingship of Charles I, William II's father-in-law. When Charles was beheaded in 1649, William wanted to bring the Stuarts back to power, which meant starting a new war. This was offensive to the regents of Holland, the wealthy non-noble patricians of the city. The conflict between the Prince of Orange and the cities therefore escalated rapidly. In 1650, William incarcerated several leading regents, one of whom was the Witt's patriarch, Jacob de Witt, and tried in vain to conquer Amsterdam. William died of a smallpox that same year, and the struggle for power surfaced among the regents. This mood was not tampered by the birth of William III eight days after the death of his father. Holland and six other provinces decided that the Dutch Republic could do without a singular authority that the state will be governed by the city aristocracies and probably call this true freedom. Along with it came a tolerant attitude toward various religious groups and a keen eye for the connection between peace and prosperity. Of this set of values, Johann de Witt became the eloquent spokesman. The brothers went separate ways but both achieved powerful positions. Cornelius became the foremost member of the administration of his hometown of Dordrecht and married the daughter of an important aristocrat from Rotterdam. With the help of his brother, Johann became chief justice of a large area. On July 30, 1653, at the age of 28, he was appointed Grand Pensionary of Holland and the chairman of the assembly. And because this province was far the wealthiest and most powerful of the Dutch Republic, it dominated the assembly of the States General, so Johann became in fact the political leader of the nation. In 1655, he married Wendela Beeker, whose father was the most influential agent of Amsterdam and had been the leader of the resistance against William II. Before Johann started his term as Grand Pensionary, the First Anglo-Dutch War broke out. Johann managed to strengthen the navy and to conclude the war as quickly as possible, which lasted between 1652 to 54. But he paid a high price for the peace. The Act of Seclusion of 1654, a secret concession to Cromwell, which stated that no Prince of Orange was to be Stadtholder or Captain General. When the other six provinces learned about it, a storm of indignation came down on Johann's head. During the 20 years of his rule, Johann tried to curtail the power of William III, but the older the prince became, the more difficult it was to contain his supporters. The gap between the proponents of the true freedom and the supporters of the prince, many of whom saw him as a kind of a messiah, became imminent. The restoration of 1660 in England brought Charles II, William's brother-in-law, to power. Charles grew into a dedicated enemy of the Dutch Republic and of Johann personally, whose domestic position he tried to undermine by persuading the Orange's party that the Grand Pensionary had denied William his family rights. When the Second Anglo-Dutch War of 1665-67 broke out, Johann sailed several times with the fleet to encourage the commanders to take offensive action. During that time, Cornelius was the deputy chosen by the states of Holland to accompany Lieutenant Admiral Michel de Ruyter in his famous raid of the Medway. With the flotilla, 
He raided Chatham dockyards and not only destroyed the biggest ships, but also tow home the Royal Charles. On this occasion, Cornelius distinguished himself greatly by his coolness and intrepidity. After this humiliation, Charles was forced to sign the peace, the Treaty of Breda. Meanwhile, Louis XIV of France, on the other side, was instigating large parts of the Spanish Netherlands in the War of Devolution. This was the territory that Johann wanted to keep as a buffer against mighty France. On January 23, 1668, he concluded the Triple Alliance with England and Sweden, and the war ended with the Treaty of Aachen in May 1668. But two years later, Louis and Charles entered the secret Treaty of Dover, by which the latter promised the former to assist in a full-scale attack on the Dutch Republic. Wow, those are a lot of treaties. For more than a year, Johann did not recognize the bad omens. He was too much a rationalist and counted completely on the balance of power. He was incapable of understanding that the French and English kings would work together in destroying the Dutch Republic because he thought it would be fatal to their own interest. He also did not grasp the fact that kings would start wars out of injured pride. When the assault came in June 1672, it was too late. Louis XIV invaded Holland and began the third of the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Cornelius once again accompanied the Ruiter in 1672 and took an honorable part in the Great Battle of Solvay against the United English and French fleets. The Dutch defeated the English and French navies but the immense French army crushed the opponent in a matter of weeks. Compelled by illness, Cornelius had to leave the fleet and found on his return to Dordrecht that the Orange Party were in the ascendant, and he and his brother were the objects of popular suspicion and hatred. As panic raged through the Republic, a hunt for scapegoats ensued. Popular feeling suddenly turned in favor of William II, and he was made stadtholder by popular acclaim. So finally, this is the time where the prisoner's gate came into the story. Hatred against the De Witt brothers resulted in an attempt on Johann's life and the detention of Cornelius, who was arrested on false accusations of treason, but he did not confess despite heavy torture and was ultimately unlawfully condemned to be banished. On August 20, as Johann was visiting his brother Cornelius in prison, were both assassinated by the same carefully organized lynch mob on the day Cornelius was to be released. The brothers were victims of a conspiracy by the Oranges, Johann Kievit and Lieutenant Admiral Cornelius Tromp. In the frenzy, the bodies were mutilated, bowels were eaten, and fingers and tongues collected as souvenirs. Their hearts were also carved out to be exhibited as trophies. It is one of the well-known cannibalization in history. The scene was forever etched on the mind of the Dutch people and was immortalized by Jan de Bing, the painter who had twice painted the scene, the corpses of the Witt brothers. Among scholars, it is still a matter of dispute whether Prince William III was behind the bloodbath because none of the conspirators were sent into trial. Now we both learned the history of the Gate Prison and the life of the Witt brothers. Now let's take a tour around the museum. The average price for a ticket is 15 euros or about 1650 dollars. <laughs> Thank you.
Today, a statue of Johann de Witt stands on the grounds where the brothers were killed. The imprisonment of the De Witt brothers in the prison gate and the subsequent events had a profound impact on Dutch history and the political landscape of the Netherlands. It highlighted the shifting balance of power and the eventual transition towards monarchy. So guys, that's our tour of the prison here, prison museum here in the bank. Till next time. So guys, if you like our videos, please subscribe to our channel and feel free to comment. Hit the bell, hit the bell, hit the bell, hit the bell, come on guys, hit the bell! For notifications! And don't forget to share! And like!